Hello, this is a video for the Tucson Bird Count that explains how to use eBird. Now this is going to be one video of a multiple video series, this one focusing on how to use eBird itself. So if you already know how to use eBird, you don't need to watch this video necessarily, but uh, I know we have some counters that are less comfortable with eBird, so this is sort of uh, for you guys to just sort of show how easy eBird to use if you've never used it before and uh, sort of show some of the benefits of it. You don't have to use eBird to do your data entry through the Tucson Bird Count, but it is a good option and I want you guys to know the information so that you know how to do it if you would like to and what it does and why it's uh, so popular with so many people. So we have here the eBird website. I'm going to adjust the camera and zoom in on it. Okay. So eBird is a couple things. It is a website and it is also an app. So now it started as a website. So fundamentally, more so than anything else, it is a website. So you literally go to ebird, e b i r d dot o r g, or dot com also works as well. But ebird dot org, and when you're doing it from a web browser, which is how uh, used to be the only way you could do it, but from the web browser, it's pretty easy. It is run by the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, and you do have to make. Uh, an account with eBird if you've never done it before. It's easy, it's totally free. They don't even want that much information. You mainly need an email address and your name. Uh, that's pretty much it. They ask for a little more, but it's optional. And so once you make an account with eBird, you can use it to submit data on just telling eBird where you went, uh, what day you were there, what time you were there, and what birds you saw, and how many. So it's actually pretty easy. So let's do a sample list. So we went we used, uh, did one of our Tucson bird count locations. We did um, you know, put the data on our data sheet and now we want to enter it into eBird. So how that works is you go to those main tabs here on eBird. There's Submit, Explore, My eBird, Science, About, News, and Help. These are the main ones, Submit, Explore, and My eBird. And um, slight digression, but the, the Explore option is actually great and it gives you all sorts of really cool information about um, where birds are and where to go find them. You don't have to actually give eBird any data to use these great output features, but there's all sorts of uh, maps and hotspot explorer and where to go birding. So under this explore option we have all sorts of great stuff. There's species maps, which is very useful. Explore hotspots, bar charts, you can set some alerts and target species. Uh, I use this a lot. So when people call and ask the Tucson Audubon Society, are the wolk, are the cranes still at Whitewater Draw? I can just go to the species map. And uh, you can put in any species here in the species map option. And so let's do Sandhill Crane. You know, crane, click on the one. And you can either uh, use the Google features that we're all pretty familiar with. Uh, if you do any online, you know, Google map stuff, you're pretty familiar with those features. You can either zoom in using the plus, so it's the same tools, it's Google, it's using a Google platform. You can zoom in or you can just put in the name of a place. So I'm going to do white, water, draw. There it is, whitewater draw pops up. And there's the hotspot, and I can see the data. Well, it's running a bit slow right now, I'm not sure what's going on. It is on the weekend I'm doing this. Um, and on 3.30, so on March 30th, 2019, there was a sighting. So anyway, eBird has all sorts of great output features, all sorts of mappings and stuff you can do. Uh, under this explore option. Hotspot Explorer or Explore Hotspots is very very good if you're trying to do um, like a trip, planning for a trip and it lets you see where are all the places people go birding and how many species they see and stuff. So there's a lot that eBird offers back to the birding community. But the main function we're going to use is the data in function where you can put in data. So that's the submit tab and it asks a few questions. It wants to know where you went birding, and it gives you a couple ways to do that. And I feel like eBird has done a very good job making itself very user-friendly, very intuitive. Uh, so it does take you through step by step. So 
where were you is the first thing it's going to ask. So you can either use a drawdown, pull down menu of everywhere you've ever entered it before. And this is going to really be a key in the next video where we talk about how to use eBird for the Tucson bird count. Uh, so you can use any location you've already been. You can find it on a map. So this uses the same technology we just looked at of Google Maps to uh, where you can go and navigate to a specific point, sort of use satellite imagery and like drop a pin. This is where I was. You can use a latitude or longitude if you'd like. You can select an entire city, county, state, or country. So if you have an old list you want to put in and all you remember is that it was in Panama, you can make the list tied to just Panama or whatever you'd like. And they have an upload import data feature, which I'll be using to put uh, historical Tucson bird cat data into eBird at a later time. But the main thing we're probably going to use is a choose from your locations tab. But you can also find it on a map too. So you figure out where you were birding. So we have to pick one. We'll do this one, uh, Atterbury Wash. Or I could have found a location on a map, like a hot spot in Madera Canyon or wherever you were birding. Then you hit continue. It wants to know the date this happened. So we'll just make it the sample for today, April 14, 2019. And it asks what type of observation type. And eBird, again, is really good at explaining itself. So a traveling count, you traveled a specific distance, like walking a trail. Stationary, you stayed at a fixed location, watching from a window, etc. Historical, birding was your primary purpose, but you cannot estimate start time, duration, distance. So a historical list is for if you have uh, data, like maybe an old checklist in a notebook that you want to enter, but you don't have all the details. Historical data is for that. Incidental is sort of like supplemental. Incidental, birding was not your primary purpose. Noting a bird while driving or gardening, etc. And then there's another, there's a bunch of other categories too. So you're going to pick one. Now for the Tucson bird count, we do five minute point counts, which are stationary. So you'd want to, in, this, in a, the example of Tucson bird count, you would definitely hit stationary. It wants to know a start time, just like the Tucson bird count does. So let's say 8 a.m. A Tucson bird count point count should be five minutes. So we'll assume it was five minutes in this case. Party size can be just however many people were there. If you're doing it by yourself, it'd be one. If you're doing it with a partner, Two or whatever applies. Uh, comment, this is where you can do sort of the site comment that we're all used to for Tucson Bird Count. So you could put a comment about anything, where you went birding, um, the, what the weather was like, the fact you saw a certain species of butterfly, anything that's not exactly bird data, you could put a comment about it here. You hit continue. And so now we've told eBird a few key things. We told it where we were, when we were there, uh, like what date, so it knows where and when. So it uses that information to give you a checklist of birds that are going to be the most likely to occur. What is this problem? Okay. So now it's showing us um, where we were, when we were there, and it's giving us a checklist of species. And if you scroll through, you can see it's done in taxonomic order. The thing about eBird is it really stays on top of taxonomy changes and species name changes. It's really, really on top of that. So as things move around, like in the last AOS um, you know, news release, they moved a lot of stuff. They moved a lot of families around, and that's very much reflected in uh, eBird. So you can scroll through and see the species that it's have here. So let's say we had a Gamble's quail on our uh, account. We had two of them, so you could put a two there. You could scroll through and click on the boxes and put in amounts, or you can actually start typing in a species in this jump to species box in the top right. So you could do, let's say we had a verdant. You start typing verdant. and then it pulls up the species and you can go, it jumps right to the box and then you can put in the amounts. So you go back to jump, start typing in the species. And you can actually go through this pretty quickly this way. If you have a rare species that isn't showing up on the list here, this is where this add species button here uh, comes in. So eBird's always trying to nudge 
it doesn't know who you are. It doesn't know your level of expertise. You could be a be rank beginning birder. You could be a super advanced birder. Eber doesn't know that. So it's always trying to nudge people into the more likely birds because in case you are a beginning birder. So if you have a species that's rare that you know what you had and it's just not really very common this time of year or this location, you can hit add species and start typing in something really rare. So we could do like olive warbler. Uh, which isn't all that likely, but there it is. So that's how you add more rare things that aren't showing up on the list. Uh, when you're done, it asks here on the bottom right, next to the big green submit button, are you submitting a complete checklist of the birds you were able to identify? So yes, if that's true. So just the birds you're able to identify. They're not asking, was every single bird there uh, counted? They're asking, of all the birds you're able to identify, did you put them all on the list? Now what they're especially asking about is common stuff. Were you ignoring morning doves and house finches. That's mostly what they're asking. It's the stuff that's kind of widespread and abundant that doesn't always make it onto a checklist. Did you try to capture those birds? And they just need to know this for their large scale studies and how they use this data. So uh, if you did indeed record everything that you were able to identify and that you detected, you can hit yes. And then when you're ready to go, you hit submit. Big submit button. And then it says, yay, this checklist has been submitted. Now, eBird is very uh, editable. Anything, if you're like, oh, I forgot to add that species, or oh, oh shoot, that's the wrong number, you can always go back to my eBird, manage my checklist, all your checklists are here, and you can view and edit, which opens up that same window we were just in, um, or you can delete them or anything you want to do. So it's very much editable. Uh, we're going to cover this more in the, the video specifically about eBird and the Tucson bird count, but this share option right here is very important. It's very important that you share your list with uh, back with the Tucson bird count um, eBird identity. But the, the great thing about share is that it's really cool in eBird in general because you can use that to share a list with your friends or a group of people that you're birding with. So if you're out birding with friends, one person can keep the eBird list and then everyone else can uh, get the list from them and then eBird understands that it was all one effort with multiple people. So eBird also has the ability and the usefulness, the very extreme usefulness of having a free app for smartphones. So uh, this is my phone here and there's a free, and I use Android, full disclosure, this is an Android phone so it might be slightly different for Apple. I have looked at this on other people's Apple phones and it doesn't seem all that different but um, it is a little different. So they have a free app for eBird, you can just search for it in you know the app store. You hit eBird, it's extremely easy to use uh, it has this nice big home page with a big old green start button. So you do a list, you're out birding, you're on location, you hit start. Now the thing about doing eBird from a phone that's really cool is your smartphone knows its location and it also knows the date and time. So that can make it very convenient using it in the field. So if you're just out birding, you can hit choose a location from a map and it knows your location so it zeroes in on that and you can zoom in and select a nearby hotspot. Uh, if you want to know more about hotspots, the eBird website does a great job in their help section explaining, but it's basically an identified location that a lot of people go birding in. So you can go to a known hotspot like Catalina Park, just north of my current location here at Tucson Audubon, or I could be like, no, I'm actually in this alley and make a new personal location. Either way, you pick a location, you hit select, it's showing you a date and time based on what the phone knows. Uh, you can accept that or reject it. If you are trying to put in some back data or you're, you know, oh, I started burning 40 minutes ago and you want to change the time, you can do that. Once it's ready, though, this big green start button shows up. Um, you can hit start and then, again, that list of birds, just like we saw on the website, shows up and you can start just select, like oh, there's a morning dove, you can hit the plus and select, you know, every time you tap it, it adds one. Uh, you can also just click on the name and a little window pops up where you can put an amount, let's say, oh, I meant two, done. Uh, you can also start typing in the name of a bird. It takes four letter codes, so we can either start typing in Gila Woodpecker or I can do G-I-W-O for Gila Woodpecker. And there it is, Gila Woodpecker. I can either hit the plus to tap in some numbers, like if I had one, I can hit one, just tap it once to hit one, or I could touch the name of the bird and put in an amount. I had two. It does have a pull down menu for breeding codes if you want. 
in a comment section so I could put, oh, uh, courtship behavior or chased off a grackle or any sort of comment like that. And then um, when you're done, there's a review option. Are you done birding? Stop track. And then it shows you, same questions. Are you submitting a complete list? Yes. What type of count? Now, it does assume based on how much you moved around, whether it was stationary or traveling, but you can still override that. So I'm like, okay, sta it's, it's suggesting stationary because it knows I didn't move. It timed me of one minute, but you can adjust that. And if I had done an actual count, that would have said maybe five or six minutes. I could change it to five minutes. How many observers? Two observers. I can share from right inside the app if I want to. And I can make a comment, and then when you're done, you hit submit, and that list is submitted. You don't have to go back on the website later and do it. It's done from your phone. It's very convenient. Uh, it's totally free, and it actually works very well. There's also an option to use this app even if you're not in cell range. You can use it uh, you know, when you're off. It's an off offline checklist. Uh, it's a pretty great option. And then once you're in cell range, then you can submit the list and choose your location. But it's really very convenient, and I use eBird so much more these days now that they have this free app option. So that's just a real rough overview of eBird. It's a very powerful tool. Uh, it's popular for a reason, and it gives a lot of data to a large central uh, database that gets used for these large-scale climate change studies and all sorts of large you know, land use, big you know, state-of-the-birds type studies. It's a very, very useful tool. I highly suggest eBird. Uh, just to be used in your birding life, leverages your efforts into science and conservation efforts. Uh, Tucson Audubon does offer periodic eBird classes. We'll be having some uh, at our festival as well as some other times. So if you're interested in eBird, uh, let me know and I can let you know when we're going to be doing another class or workshop because I think eBird is well worth the time and effort to learn how to use it. Thank you so much and the next video will feature how to use eBird specifically for the Tucson bird count.